The list of British military personalities who have shaped the nation's cultural zeitgeist is pretty long. There's Walter Raleigh, Horatio Nelson, Flashman, Ant Middleton. To that list, we might one day add another name. Joe Glenton, my guest today, journalist and author of a new book, Veteranhood, Rage and Hope in British Ex-Military Life. Joe, welcome to Downstream. Thanks, mate. Good to see you. How does it sound to be in that in that, you know, a lot, placed alongside such prestigious names as Ant Middleton and Flashman. And uh, definitely Flashman. I love Flashman and I love George MacDonald Fraser. I think he, he's got a really interesting critique of military, the military and, and empire. Uh, maybe less so Ant Middleton, but I guess we'll get to him. More of him in a moment, <laughs> yeah. So for, for people who aren't necessarily familiar with your story, you were in the army for mm -hmm. six years. Mm -hmm. You were court-martialed. Yep. So you have this interesting dynamic at play where you actually served for a really long time, but then you left under conditions which most people would say, well, that's, that's, that's quite unusual. And it is. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it is it's a very, yeah. very yeah. small number of people in, who, who exit in that way. Can you just explain your time in the military, why you joined up and, and why you left in such a manner? Definitely, yeah. I was definitely, um, I joined the ranks. I'm working class from a working class background and very often the military is um, seen as a route out of, out of poverty, out of menial jobs, which is what I was doing. Um, and I joined in 2004, 22. I think I was working in a factory or something at the time um, and was keen and green and wanted to go and do that, kind of drank the Kool-Aid and bought, bought how it was sold to us, I think, because you can go and do something of some social value around the world. Um, and went to Afghanistan um, and the rationale we were, the various complex uh, rationales we were giving kind of fell away during that seven months in 2006 and also the uh, my my understanding of what the institution was and how it operated internally and in society um, so a lot of that shifted over that that period so i um had planned to just get out of the military i didn't agree with it i developed i suppose what you could call a conscientious objection but i don't know if i consider myself a conscientious objector now um and um yeah was Supposed to go on another tour, was told I was going on another tour, refused, tried to go down the route of conscientious objection. There's a conscientious objection board, it's something you're contractually and legally allowed to do. Um, that was refused, uh, voted with my feet, went on the run for 18 months, which is more common than you might expect if you look at the ABLE statistics. Um, and during that period, um, during that whole period, I think I started to, my politics started to develop, came back from AWOL um, and became an anti-war campaigner. So a really unusual route was eventually um, was charged with AWOL, then I was charged with desertion. We went to court, they dropped the desertion because we challenged the legalities of the war um, and ended up, was given a nine month sentence in Colchester Military Prison, did five with remission uh, and came out. So an unusual, an unusual time. The nation's favorite disgrace to Queen and country, a good friend of mine who was also in the military calls me. And I'm quite proud of that handle. Five months in military prison, what was that like? Um, I suppose it would be, uh, in civilian terms, it'd be like a low security prison, but it's a military regime and they're all short sentences. So it's a maximum of 18 mm. months. Uh, but I was in the wing D company, D wing, if you like, which was for the people being discharged. So it was a lot of guys who'd been in quite a long time, had held rank, had done multiple tours. And in many cases, the reasons they were there were connected to military operations, PTSD, trauma, um, had, had um, uh, kind of interrupted their lives. So a lot of people in there for violence, drugs, self-medication, domestic violence, AWOLs like me. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting, it was really interesting. But my wing of the prison was basically in a complete, a virtually complete state of mutiny for the whole time I was there. So do you think most of the people being quote unquote punished by the British state, mm -hmm. you, you think most of them were suffering from issues that related to, to trauma and actually could yeah, have yeah. been seen through another lens? Yeah, I think that was that was generally, anecdotally that was the case. Lots of people had post-traumatic stress and varying, varying degrees of um, mental health issues, mostly derived from operations and other stuff. Because the guys who go into the ranks are generally already damaged. And it's something I discussed in the book that you come in, you often come in with problems because of the the where you're coming from, you're coming from smashed up northern towns that have kind of been trundled over by Thatcherism. Um, so very often that there was a complex mix of mental health problems um, that led them there. And that, I guess, mixes with a really interesting assertion in the book, which is that it isn't just the service which is traumatic, but it's mm. actually the training which is traumatic, because the whole point of military training is that you traumatise people, preparing them for trauma. Yes. Can you explain that concept a bit? Because it was really original to me, but once I sort of engaged, I thought, wow, that. That makes so much sense. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's we kind of, in a, culturally, we kind of understand post-traumatic stress. It's kind of shell shock, but updated. And we kind of have, there's a, there's a kind of broad cultural understanding that doing 
things in war, exposure to extreme violence can be damaging. But I think leaning on that too much or censoring it kind of kind of lets the military off the hook. And the, uh, my assertion in the book, and I draw on a bunch of ex-military psychologists and psychotherapists, is that military training and military culture lead to a lot of the problems that people have later in life because it's supposed to change you from a civilian from day one you're not a fucking civilian anymore that, and that's the way they they frame it um, and they what they're trying to inv- kind of instill you with a sense of urgency a capacity for aggression uh, and that cycle is repeated throughout it's not just basic training makes you ill it's the military culture and military training which over many years potentially is reinforced and reinforced again and again it's actually um, I, I make the case what leads to a lot of issues afterwards uh, for people coming out. Because when you're released back into the civilian world, you're kind of primed at the start. But when you're released back into the civilian world, you're not demilitarized and you still respond to stress in the same way um, and trauma in the same way. And it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work in civilian life. You can't be like that in civilian life. And this is an institutional problem mm-hmm. because it's not like the British Army can change two or three things. And this will no longer be an issue. Your yeah, contention yeah. is that it's a fundamental part of the training, of the culture, of the institution, is to create subjects who are, I think you, the words you use are, near permanent state of eruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. That, that necessarily means you're going to be just, it's almost like a production line of people with trauma and PTSD. Exactly, yeah. And it, I think in that context, it makes sense that people would be pumped up and have a capacity to switch on aggression. It makes complete sense in that context. Mm. The problem is afterwards. But I draw Nick Fothergill, Nick Fothergill, who's an Australian Vietnam veteran and a psychologist, and it's actually a course, it's a grainy old YouTube video which you can find. Um, and it's actually a course which is used in a lot of um, um, aftercare services like Combat Stress, the big military mental health charity. Show it to people who are coming in, it's a lifestyle course. And he explains at length this, this process by which you're changed from a civilian into a soldier or a sailor or an airman. I think particularly soldiers though, because the training's more aggressive in the, mm. in, um, the, the infantry type units. Um, th- this process of, of changing you. And then he, he's talking to a group of veterans and their partners and families and trying to say, look, this is, this is not about war trauma. This is about culture and training um, and, and trying to kind of help them unpick, unpick this thing. And I, I interviewed various other people as well who more or less came to the same conclusion. But I think the key thing is PTSD can compound, war trauma can compound those things, um, but it often is not the source of them. That's military training and military culture. The conclusion of that would therefore be that the identity, the subjecthood of being a veteran mm-hmm. as being distinct from the rest of the public as, Absolutely. as somebody experiencing all these things, which rightly or wrongly, it's not something that somebody's going to sort of judge, but that's how many people who leave the military feel yeah. because they have gone, something, gone through something quite different to everybody else. Exactly, yeah. You think that necessarily creates mental ill health? I think so, yeah, yeah. And it also creates all kinds of social stuff as well. I mean, there is a there is a contempt. And I, it amazes me every time when you see Remembrance Day, civilians pouring into Whitehall mm. to celebrate. And, and if you've been in the military, uh, and I think if you're frank with yourself, you, you look at those people and then you think about how the military thinks about them. And there's a deep, profound level of contempt and othering of civilians. Mm. At the top of the high, we talk about the hierarchy of contempt, which at the bottom of that is the enemy. Mm. Whoever he may be, he's nebulous. He could be Russian, he could be Japanese, he could be anyone. He doesn't really exist until, until he appears in front of you. Um, above that, other soldiers or sailors, there's inter-service rivalry and inter-regimental rivalry. But the real contempt, in my opinion, is for civilians, particularly civilians at home. There's a different category for civilians in the places where we may fight wars. But there's a particular level of contempt for civilians because they're framed from day one. You're not one of them anymore. You're not a fucking civilian now. Um, uh, and they're, they're framed as kind of weak, effeminate, in need of our protection with a kind of warrior protector. It's really primal stuff. Um, and I think that's broadly shared, whatever part of the military you're in, reservist or regular, full-time or part-time, that still exists to a degree. And it's instilled in basic training and it's reinforced throughout your military career. And this is quite new because I guess it arrives with, with large professional armies, which of course is, yeah, yeah. you know, it's a recent phenomenon. It's recent, it's yes. the 1950s, 60s. Exactly, yeah. And it's hard to have that kind of binary of, you know, civilians and this warrior yeah, class yeah, yeah. if you've got mass conscription, like exactly, you do yeah, during yeah. the Second World War, for instance. Yeah, I think um, I think that's really apparent. I'll draw on his, uh, Alan Allport, who's a historian of demobilization, talks about the, the sense that in World War II, they felt they were... It was, they, were, they, went, they were conscripted and they went grudgingly and they felt they were almost cosplaying. This was a thing they would have to do. And many people in Second World War understood the threat of fascism 
um, I think, but this was not like, um, it wasn't internalized as a kind of warrior identity. Mm -hmm. So like we have to go and fight the Germans or the Japanese um, or whatever. And that's very different from the kind of small, separatist, culturally backward, um, often very nostalgist um, kind of culture of the modern British Army or the modern Royal Navy. I think it's a very different thing. Um, and that's, that's a key difference that comes out again and again in the book, conscription, conscripted armies versus professional armies have a different, have a very different culture internally. There's a nice formulation which kind of conveys this, which is that the veteran is the Spartan mm -hmm. that finds themselves in Athens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the whole culture that's being instilled, which has these traumatic consequences for, for, the, for, the, for the veteran himself, mm -hmm. also has these, these broader political consequences because you have these values that are being, they're, being, uh, they're internalizing. Mm -hmm. Um, which are completely odds with the kind of values of a liberal democratic society, exactly. which is toleration, equality, mm -hmm. um, you know, a live and let live mentality. Yeah. Um, and, and that's very different to us and them. Yeah. We protect you. You need us. Without us, you know, it all falls to shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is that is that do you think that's a useful sort of uh, way of looking at it? The veteran is so, yeah. the Spartan that finds himself in democratic Athens, or is it, is that just something that some veterans choose? Because obviously some do. They love. The, we'll talk about this more later. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Spartan yeah. tattoos and so on. Yeah. How many veterans actually do think like that? Do you think is it a mass phenomenon, or is it a significant minority? Or it, I think it varies um, uh, depending on the time. I think it's particularly with. A key thing that came out from the work of a guy called Jerry Lemke, who's also a sociology professor in America, but also a Vietnam veteran, is that it's particularly defeated armies, which search for the stab in the back, the dolch stoss. And he weaves this amazing narrative. He goes from, um, from uh, Odysseus coming home um, and hating civilians at home to, um, to uh, the American Civil War. So the, um, the uh, Confederate army starting to Klu Klux Klan to discipline, discipline these effeminate, traitorous mm -hmm. uh, people who conceded to the, to the North. Um, he talks about Vietnam, he talks about the French in Algeria and Indochina, but it's particularly, I think, defeated armies who kind of regress, who kind of crawl back into this kind of weird revanchist warrior thing, particularly. I think there are many people um, outside that who probably subscribe to it as well, and many people in the military who do not, who do not subscribe to that, who see themselves as kind of citizen soldiers. And I think some of that depends on where you come from. So I interview people in the book who are, who's back, like guys from the, well, the Red Valleys of Ronda uh, and the North who came in with kind of left-wing ideas and, uh, and are much less um, susceptible to that kind of thing. But it's definitely a thing now. And I think, I think it's relevant for us, the US and British armies, because we are, a, we are defeated armies. Afghanistan and Iraq, we failed. They'll always say, oh, we weren't militarily defeated, but you crawled away with your tail between your legs. Um, and I think that is what fuels some of the weird revanchist shit and the which shades into, expresses as kind of self-help influencer stuff. And I guess we'll talk about it, guys. Who, everyone's, everyone runs a podcast now and there's like Spartan. They have a Spartan or a Viking or a samurai. And you kind of see this stuff. So it's almost like the world isn't morally good enough. So they have to go back to this imagined utopia of warrior ideals, hence the Spartans or the Vikings or, or whoever. So there's a lot of complex and angry stuff going on in there. The influencer thing is super interesting, mm -hmm. which is obviously it's grown I mean, exponentially since I think almost withdrawal yeah. from from Iraq. It's something that I've noticed really in the last five or six years. In the UK, you've got Ant Middleton, but in the US, it's just enormous. You know, David Goggins, Jocko Willink, um, Stanley McChrystal, who was a general. Yeah. You know, this is what I always find really strange is that people are going to Stanley McChrystal. He's like doing, you know, consultancy and podcasts and how to be a winner. Mm -hmm. He's saying, I eat one meal a day. I sleep four hours. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I run seven miles. It's like, well, Maybe this is why you lost. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. four hours sleep a night is not particularly conducive to good decisions. No. Yet they're still seen as these authorities on yeah. warrior ideals, winning, triumph. Yeah, yeah. How can corporations internalize these values, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. It's like this whole thing just happened, and we're not going to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it does feel like the kind of extraordinary extent and reach and intensity of that influencer sphere is a direct reflection of the failure that's basically preceded it yeah. since. Since 9-11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think on a fundamental level, um, like I think if you look at particularly like special forces influence, Middleton and so on, it's a grift. Like a lot of self-help shit, it's a grift. They're trying to kind of cash in on the kind of warrior kudos they've developed. And to be honest, I kind of understand. I understand why you would do that. Like a lot of guys come out of the special forces and they work private security. They become private military contractors and so on. And that's not, it's dried up a lot in the last 10 years. Um, but if you could, you know, if I could pitch a documentary to Channel 4 and say, 
Royal Logistics Corps, are you tough enough or whatever? I would probably do it. I understand the dynamic behind it. Um, they're trying to make some money. But yeah, there is, there is a weird disengage. And yeah, this idea that um, that what these particular warrior values can like supercharge your Bitcoin business or, mm. or the 10 easy lessons for just 9.99 a month. I can give you my warrior, my warrior wisdom or whatever. It's really weird because the background of that, of course, is just gigantic professional failure. And the story of Iraq and Afghanistan is we, we may have won tactical victories here or there when insurgents chose to go toe to toe. But overall, it's just a massive, massive failure. So yeah, it's, 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 straight, it's disconnected from reality for a start. But obviously it has mass appeal. Like these people are making lots of money out of it. They're getting the opportunity to make their documentaries and films and podcasts. And I think that's fundamentally what they've recognised in this. And what's the relationship between this, these ideals of, of discipline and I think often unnecessary suffering? Mm-hmm. Somebody like Jocko Willink, his Instagram account is made basically pictures of him showing what time he gets up at like 5am yeah, yeah, or yeah. something. Yeah, it's bizarre. You think, mate... You, your body needs seven or eight hours to sleep. I mean, yeah. If you get up at 5 a.m. and you've slept eight hours, <laughs> I couldn't do it. No, but no, no. Fantastic. No. But it feels like you know, you're know you hurting yourself. You're putting yourself through this. You're having suboptimal performance, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is what I thought this whole culture was about, yeah. to show that you know I, I can do it. And it's a bit like, I guess, let's talk about Ant Middleton, you know, when he was confronted with the whole COVID thing. You know, he thought it was a mind over matter thing yeah. that you, know, you don't need to be vaccinated because you, you, you're tough enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just push through. Yeah, I mean, he's a really interesting example because he's kind of a budget version of Goggins and Willink and people like that. And he's obviously kind of ch- happened upon this thing and thought, and he is, like, he's doing very well out of it. Um, but he's an interesting character because I think, <laughs> I know they're not particularly articulate people, but they're a lot more articulate than Ann Middleton. I mean, he's, I mean, his background's kind of interesting as well, where he came from. He is, and I go into it in the book, he is obviously himself profoundly traumatised. He was initially in the army as a boy soldier and he came from a quite troubled background. His dad died very young, et cetera, et cetera, um, and was brutally bullied, brutally bullied in the, in the army, in um, the airborne engineers, um, and then left and then got into lots of trouble, but then ended up in the Royal Marines and kind of found his feet and became a, an SBS soldier. But he's almost a classic example of the kind of, he's almost an argument against recruiting very young, which is still a thing in this country. And you can see he's He's kind of badly damaged. There's lots of emotions which have been kind of held inside, which is kind of another function of army training. That You bite back, you just mm. crack on with the job. There's this hyper-focus on something and everything, any kind of emotional issues go to the side. And it's almost like he's, a, he's a, the, the quintessential example of this kind of repressed masculinity, which just is ex- expresses as massive anger. And you saw that with some of his comments around COVID, um, also around BLM. He was very critical of BLM. He kind of paired them in. He claims not to have done, but he kind of paired them in with um, with the EDL when there was a bit of uh, a bit of pushing and shoving going on down in Whitehall last year. I mean, he's a, he's a really good example. I mean, some of the other guys around him are not. Um, some of the other guys on SS who dares wins are not quite like that. I, my impression is they're slightly different people and probably more sensible people. Um, but I, there's a sense that he's kind of this this guy who's trying to patch together narratives, and this is a problem that comes out again and again the kind of military, it's trying to see the world through the lens of the military hard man. And it's the training and the culture expressing. And the reason it looks so silly at times and so jarring is because it just doesn't work. You can't understand the world in the black and white, bad faith lens of the military. And that come, it comes out again and again when you look at not just him, but other figures like him. There are many, many, many people who get incredibly angry about individuals who've lied about being in the military. Yeah. yeah. Maltism. Yeah, where, yeah. where does this come from? Um, so the Walter Mitty thing, in the US it's known as, it's slightly more dramatic sounding, stolen valour, it's the idea of some kind of bravery or courage and you're tapping into it illegitimately. Um, but it's, the Walter Mitty thing is, is, is quite British and it's based on this kind of fictional character who's a fantasist, who has this like inner life which is just not true. Um, but in this country, Walter Mitty is, is the common term for someone who, and there are degrees of this, someone who pretends they've been in the military or has been in the military but pretends, say they were a chef and they pretended they were in the parachute regiment. And so it's expressed in different forms, but it really riles up military people, kind of understandably, because in the military, one of the things that happens in the training and culture is you're socialised into understanding a rigid hierarchy of badges and different coloured berets. Uh, and people take that out into the world. And the idea that you would pretend to be something you're not is really, really frowned upon. And some people who do this are just, it's the, you know, it's the guy who's never in the military who rattles a charity tin with a beret on. Um, to try and scam some money, right up to people who are trying to tap into welfare services, which are for veterans. Mm. Um, so there, there are degrees. 
but in nearly all cases, in the mainstream, the blazer community, the mainstream veteran community, it really causes gigantic anger. The idea that someone would just waltz in, literally waltz in and just steal um, steal valor, which would try and try and claim some you know, claim knowledge of military prowess and so on. I mean, I totally get. I can totally get the anger. I think that's that's entirely explicable. I get yeah. it. But when you see these sort of Facebook groups trying to pursue people, it's a huge expenditure of energy. It is. Um, and you look at, say, a doctor, mm. right? There are, there are lots of people out there who, who lie about being doctors. Mm. Uh, and the people who are doctors made immense sacrifices, different sorts of sacrifices. They didn't go through necessarily traumatic training mm. like uh, veterans, but you've been educated for 10 years, you've worked extraordinary hours, you, you could potentially sacrifice you know, your family, all sorts of things. And they don't set up Facebook groups saying, you know, this scumbag has claimed to be a doctor, we're going to ruin yeah. him, tell the truth to everyone. There's this compulsive element to it with the Walter Mitty stuff. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to denigrate anyone who does it, because it's clearly a mass phenomenon. There's something mm -hmm. deeper which is driving it. Yeah. So, so what explains that? Why do, why do doctors not do it, but veterans, some um, veterans well, I think do? It, it probably, it's probably a broader comment there just about society, that we, we live in Britain, it's a former imperial power, it hasn't quite realised this fact yet, and that the military is prized above anything. Mm. You can look at the way they talk about veterans in Parliament and the things they do to NHS staff, uh, is, is an example of that. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's something deeper there. And I, uh, people, tap, people do it for different reasons. And I, you know, I, for some of those people, there's probably, like uh, the Walter Mitty Hunters Club and organisations like this, some of the people they're pursuing are like deluded. I mean, there's mental problems there. Um, others are fraudsters, and uh, there are laws to deal with fraud. Um, and other, there, there are others who, I mean, the case of Azi Ahmed, um, who I talk about in the book, who's a, a Tory, was a Tory parliamentary candidate who tried to allegedly tried to bloat her service. She was in the TA as a clerk, and she claimed some connections to the SAS. So bloating, if you just explain, that's a bit different yeah, bloating, to waltzing. Yeah, bloating is. Um, there's a lot of these terms, and they they kind of mingle in with it. So bloating and waltzing. Uh, bloating is when. So Mark Francois would probably be a bloater because he was in the military, but he kind of makes a lot of his service. Or again, if you were a, you're a clerk in the RAF and you claimed you were in the special boat service, that would be, so you're um, uh, kind of expanding on your military service illegitimately. But there are all kinds of motivations um, behind it. And some, some of them are like people are mentally ill and they want to dress up as soldiers because that's the compulsion that comes with their illness. Others are chancers and grifters who are trying to cash mm. in. Um, so I, I, when I'm writing about it, I always try and make distinguish those different groups, because some of them probably do deserve some degree of sympathy. I mean, others, it's even more base than that. Sometimes, uh, very often, if you look on the Walter Mitty Hunters Club, they do they have a WordPress blog and these long, turgid kind of screeds about... about it's amazing. These, yeah. I was reading, for a preparation of this, I was reading <laughs> through it. And I thought, this is, these are amazing stories. Are, I yeah, mean, yeah. it looks, the, the amount of energy they've put in, I think it's really worth it. Yeah, but yeah. it is very interesting. Yeah, I mean, they, they're, they're obsessed. They themselves are, are, are obsessive. Uh, but I mean, in some cases, it's um, some guy will pretend to have... Um, He'll post a picture of himself in a Royal Marines beret because he wants to be more attractive to, to the opposite sex or whatever. Um, uh, so there, there's that element as well. But it's a whole complex, weird network of things. And I suppose my uh, when I was in around VFP, we kind of developed a different way of thinking about this because we were instinctively accused of being Waltz, um, our critics, who is the basic veteran, veterans, veterans for Peace, which is an anti-war veterans organisation, founded by a guy who's in the SAS, full of people who were in elite forces, many of whom were decorated for valour. So not a Walty organisation. But the instinctive response from the Blazer community was, your Walter Mitty, you, you all came out of the army in day two of basic training because you're soft, etc., etc. Um, whereas actually what we were, and I am, I suppose, is a kind of anti wall And the, the key argument is that we're not trying to cash in on military valour. We kind of reject it. We don't think there's anything, any valour to steal in the sense that maybe the, the, the anti-wall cohort seem to think there is. So it's a much deeper critique of, of that whole thing. Um, we're not trying to cash in on something. We're trying to say this isn't what you think it is. This isn't good. It's not positive. You shouldn't be desperate to, to tick these boxes of martial prowess and so on and so on. So it's a much more compl complicated analysis. You mentioned Azi Ahmed in passing just a second ago. Mm -hmm. What's her story? I mean, that's a pretty amazing one as well. It's somebody I'd never encountered and then I read no, about no, her no. in your book. Yeah, and she'd been going for a few years by the time I encountered her and I wrote, a, wrote an article. She tried to sue me about it. She was a Tory parliamentary candidate um, and she'd been a clerk in um, the Army Reserves and she'd been attached to 21 SAS, which is the London part-time reserve SAS unit. Um, and she did that, got out, went into business, um, I think, and then, um, and then years later, she reappeared as a Tory parliamentary candidate. 
claiming, and this was where it got, it was contested, claiming that she'd, or she'd been on some version of SAS selection, this incredibly hard thing, people regularly die trying to do it, running up Penny Fan in the Brecon Beacons and all this kind of stuff. Um, and lots of people who had been in special forces or were in special forces or elite units contested this. But the interesting thing about her was that she got all the way, she was quite embedded in the Tory establishment, to the point where she did a warm-up speech for Michael Fallon when she was Defence Secretary, and she kind of regurgitated these same claims. She went on Loose Women, and she wrote a book about it, um, uh, which was basically the framing was like a Muslim girl with the SAS. And you can kind of see how people would jump on it, because it's partly like intersectional imperialism, mm. and it's partly like a good migrant story. Like yeah. she came from the uh, conservative Muslim background, she appears. Very marketable. Yeah, very mar very sellable. Um, and she wrote, wrote a book about it. And then later on, the people started to contest that. A lot of the mainstream press wouldn't pick it up, when I wrote a story about it, which was for RT, of all places, um, some of the Daily Mail Times correspondents were like, ah, oh, it's so good that you actually did that story. We've been waiting for ages. I even got in touch with Johnny Mercer and said, can you comment on this? And he was like, I can't because I'm in the story about it, basically, was what he inferred. Uh, but obviously, I'm really, uh, I really don't know what's happening. And eventually, after that story, because it was for RT, it's a weird part of the dynamic, she wrote, um, wrote a piece in the... Uh, Telegraph or something saying the Kremlin, the Kremlin are trying to attack Michael Fallon through me. Anyway, in the end, she she stopped being a Tory parliamentary candidate. The last I heard of her, she wrote an article for the Guardian about she didn't agree with the Tories' Brexit position and had joined that most um, voracious of political parties, the Liberal Democrats. And then I don't know where she is now. She's kind of vanished. So we may never know the truth of um, of, of her claims, uh, but she's an, she's a, a very distinct and unique kind of alleged Walter Mitty. This concept, this prison through which to understand so much the Walt. Mm -hmm. You even extend to Britain. You call mm -hmm. it Walt Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, this brings to mind, you talk about it in the book, you know, you'll see images of Prince Charles walking around, you know, wearing yeah. his military regalia and dripping with medals. And of course, he's never fought in any battles whatsoever. No. This is the ultimate Walt and he's the future head of state. Arguably, yeah, yeah. So, um, so what, what, does that, what does that mean, Walt Island? What does it mean well, to say that everyone in Britain is Walting? I'm, I guess I'm trying to make a comment on the way uh, we think about it's kind of it, we're, everything is coloured sepia everything's World War II everything's Dunkirk everything's the Battle of Britain and it's the, this kind of um, the rupture with empire and the fact we can't deal with it and we claim to be this military power and punching above our weight is the term they always use and I think it's it's obviously there are individuals who do this but actually it's something much deeper that we're in love with the, the, the military ideal and the idea of a martial Britain which is not true like we're not a major player militarily, and we need to accept that. So I think there's something deeper um, going on in there. And in that sense, almost like people say Normal Island, we're at Walter Mitty Island um, as well. I mean, a, another example, the, the, the Royal's very interesting, but also there's, a, there's something called the um, Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme. So parliamentarians go away so many days a month in their constituencies, and they go to the local TA base or the Navy ship or whatever, and they wear uniform, uh, and they, they kind of bimble around fire guns. You remember the images of Liz Kendall stood on top of a tank during the leadership contest against Jeremy Corbyn. I think I've seen Wes Streeting recently. Wes Streeting, well, you yeah, know, yeah. Your tweet was, his, what do you call him? Holding uh, a... I can't remember. A bangy-wangy bang something. You know, yeah, sort of... bangy-bangy shoot-shoot. Yeah, yeah. And, but you see, and it, it, it's, it's vaulting, it's vicarious stuff. But it's interesting that the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme is also, like a lot of those, like Labour Friends of the Armed Forces, is a kind of a stage prop for arms firms. They're both deeply connected with arms firms. And a lot of the funding for the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme is arms firms. You can look through their, their MP's Facebook images of their visits and there'll be like an MP sat in the cockpit of a Harrier and there'll be an RAF officer in uniform with a BAE Systems hat leaning over him showing, the, showing him the cockpit and the workings of it. And so both of those are Labour Friends of the Armed Forces as well, whose, um, whose talk at the Labour Conference just gone was sponsored by Leonardo Helicopters. Um, the Italian Arms the, Company. The Italian Arms who've, who've been connected with war crimes in Nigeria recently. There are allegations that their equipment was used to, to bomb some villages in Nigeria. Um, so they're deeply, deeply connected. And I know it's particularly right-wing Labour MPs who love it because the Tories have traditional connections to the armed forces. Mm. There are very few veterans um, in the Labour Party. Dan Jarvis, Clive Lewis. Uh, Clive Lewis was TA anyway. It's not to denigrate the service, Clive. Um, but, uh, but it's a very different thing. So it's particularly right-wing Labour MPs um, who are really attached to like dressing up as soldiers, waltzing, stolen valour. And then they can come back to Parliament and in their interventions they can say, I spent two days in the officer's mess drinking tea and having spotted dick with uh, the local RAF regiment. And it makes them look good. So that, I would also classify that as a form of waltzing. So you classify the Labour MPs as waltzing, but so what? But, but, but it's state-sponsored waltzing. It's a different kind. But it's that relationship. Acceptable. But there's an interesting kind of um, configuration here because you've got the MPs who obviously haven't 
served in the armed forces. You, mostly, no. no. Yeah, mostly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you've got the weapons companies, and then you've got you, Labour friends of the armed forces. Yeah, yeah. So where do they fit in there? Because obviously those those guys aren't waltzing. No, no, it's Less, like the MPs. No, 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 no. But they're still yeah, playing yeah. their part here. So yeah, how does Labour, that work? It's a slightly different thing. I, I, I view, and I've interviewed a couple of veterans about this in the book. They're kind of a, a kind of stage prop for the Labour riot. L- LFOF was defunct under Corbyn, which is a shame because it could have been an opportunity to use to use that. But basically, it was always a little kind of cabal of people, kind of Henry Jackson type Labour people, some arms firms people, and they're they're a bunch of councillors who are veterans mm. who are around it as well. So it's not waltzing in the purest sense, mm. but it is kind of part of the kind of militarist infrastructure that the Labour right has internally, and they use it use it to kind of suggest a certain proximity and understanding of, of the military and veterans and so on. So on. And, and this suits Labour MPs because, like you say, there's a bit of... Um, there's a deficit here compared to the Tory party. Absolutely. Who have, yeah. who have genuine, yeah. authentic, deep-breaching connections to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. ...the military-industrial complex, mm-hmm. armed forces and so on. Yeah. Although some of their people are also bloaters, like you say, Mark Francois. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So let's stick with this for a moment. Because I suppose they would say, Labour friends of the armed forces, who you, you would say, I suppose you'd say they're on the, the political, they would call themselves the political centre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think probably on social issues, more right wing than yeah. most Labour people. Um, <laughs> on the economy redistribution, I mean, it's pretty, it's yeah, quite yeah. flexible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they would say that, how dare you? Of course they would. Call, call, call them waltz. Yeah. And there's, there's, or even that they do business with Waltz, or that they're providing cover for Waltz. Yeah. Um, and then you've also got, you know, uh, Tories who are similar-ish to them, sort of centrist Tories. I mean, I encountered a few of these when yeah. I said I was going to interview you. Yeah. And they said, oh, this guy is a, you know, windbag or whatever. Yeah. I mean, he can't call you a Walt because you were in the army for six years. Mm-hmm. But they, they try and denigrate you as much as possible. Of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, so t- why is that? Because you, you, you were court-martialed, etc. You deserted. But I think mean, yeah. Afghanistan wasn't a particularly nice, or, or Iraq, wasn't a particularly nice place to be. I think most people could understand it, or it's explicable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so think, why why do they dislike you so much? I, mean, I, get, I guess I have a kind of jarring effect. I don't really fit with that. And, but I suppose the other part is that the book is full of interviews with veterans who seem to generate similar opinions. I mean, I interview some people who aren't on the left um, as well, or not in the sense that I would... I would Consider meaningfully left wing, um, but yeah, I think it's very jarring uh, when people come along. There's no space. There's no space in the dominant narrative around veterans and what they want for veterans who are on the left, mm. and it really kind Which of worries you, and, them. And you consider that to be there's quite a few of those people. Yeah, there's lots you, of them. you don't yeah. think they're the majority, and, and but there's just, a significant. Yeah, number not of just now. There is a, what I'm trying to encapsulate here in a potted form because I'm not a historian. I'm going out of a historian who cringes at my attempts to interpret history mm. um, uh, to try and talk about the long radical military tradition, both of serving people and military veterans, all the way at the basis of politics in Britain, all the way back to the Putney debates, the new model army, and then the resurgences. The the veterans were killed at Peterloo, they were in the crowd. Um, The first and the second world wars, and so on and so on. There is this tradition. It's perfectly possible to be left-wing and ex-military. And it's something I wanted, I wanted to, to, to reinforce that it's normal and healthy. And if you're a wor- working class person in the ranks, you should be on the left, is, is the case I'm trying to make. Uh, and draw on these, these long and fascinating radical traditions um, of people in the ranks. Yeah, that, that was actually the, sort of the, the opening chapters of the book. Because, I mean, later on, you sort of deal with these bigger issues like, we'll talk about that in a minute, troop fucking, yeah, yeah, yeah. blazerism, yeah. waltzing, all these sort of really interesting ideas later on the book. But like I said, at the beginning, there's an appeal to, well, there's a different history here mm-hmm. with the British Armed Forces. The first army, the army, was, of course, like I said, the New Model Army. Mm-hmm. Incredibly radical basis yeah. uh, upon which it was created. I think the, mo- the most junior rank of officer, which was a cornet, mm-hmm. arrested King Charles I, which yeah. is, you know, that's a, a social revolution in and of itself. Yeah. And then, of course, that descends into Cromwellian authoritarianism, but he himself is faced down with sort of levelling elements, ultra-democratic elements. Yeah. Later on, Peter Liu, sort of post-Napoleonic, sort of democratic pushback. A lot of that's from demob troops. Yep. First World War, Second World War. There's a huge history there. There is. Do you, do you think you could have just read a history book about all this stuff? Because it's something that we don't talk about much in this country. Maybe there's a history book in it. Um, and should I develop the skills of a historian to do that? I mean, there are really good writers on it. I draw on people like John Rees, for example, on the, his mm. book, The Level of Revolution, is fantastic. World War II, I draw on Alan Allport. I, mean, I don't think he's a radical particularly, but writes a very good um, a good history of those things. Yeah, I think and it's, and it's certainly not the case that I'm saying that 
um, that uh, the military armies have been like full to the brim with lefties. It's that that is a current and it's an ex- perfectly easy to understand. It's explicable that people go through the experience of war, you go through that kind of ferment of those turbulent times, whatever they may be, a world war or an English war against a, a tyrannical monarch. It's perfectly reasonable that people would arrive at those positions. And when you look at, in fact, when you look at the, 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 the agitators in the new model army, what they wanted, it's almost the same. It's like a proper post-war settlement. Mm. It's like pensions for widows. It's like indemnity for war crimes, which is expressed again and again now with Johnny Mercer and Dennis Hutchings and Soldier F and things like that. I mean, they're recognisable. I think veterans today could recognise um, the common ground. And also, in the, at that time, they're talking about much bigger things like the commons, um, suffrage and things like that. And so what I'm really trying to say is there is another tendency. I'm not trying to say it's the dominant one, uh, though maybe it has been at times, but I'm trying to say there is something there um, that which we should recognise. And, and we shouldn't on the left, and there can be a tendency in some sections of the left, marginal sections happily, to be like, if you were in the military, you're basically a small C Tory or you're a fascist. And it's just not true. I know veterans who are involved in every radical, every radical movement of our times, whether it's student stuff, whether it's um, uh, radical independence, whether it's Rep- Irish republicanism, whether it's um, uh, climate change stuff, Northern Independence Party, full of veterans, obviously, because there's all these young lads from up north. Um, they're, they're there. But I think the difference is they're not as visible because unlike right wing veterans, we don't tend to put it in our bio on Twitter. We, we, we don't want to lead with it because it's cringy. And that's what they say. They, the most common response was because it's really fucking cringy to do that. But they are there. And I think we should recognise um, that they are and kind of talk about it. You, it's a tradition. Do you think that's something that you need to create? Is that something you hope to do with the book? Create sort of pole of attraction by which sort of more progressive socialist veterans can identify? Yeah, it's a question that comes out in the book. I'm a terrible romantic about the idea of kind of the National Union of Ex-Servicemen 2.0 and uh, the anarcho squaddies. Um, I don't... <laughs> Cooler heads are like, I don't think it's going to happen because in the First and Second World War, mm. um, there wasn't the same, uh, for example, there was demobilisation, which aggrieved a lot of people. It's a very slow process, mm. of, particularly in the First World War, demobilisation. I don't know that um, it could happen in the same way. Also, the kind of hegemonic institutions of the veteran community, RBL, Health for Heroes, are leader. really deeply attached to the, to the state um, to the, and the ruling class. And it's, it's be harder now to organise them, I think. But what I do say in the book is that I would like it to be, to start a conversation and that the people I've encountered through it who share their ideas with me and we can continue to, to talk about how to represent veterans better on the left. Um, and we can maybe move, move forward from there. I don't think there's going to be another new model army agitators thing around the corner, if I'm honest. I would love that to be the case. Well, certainly not in this country. Like They're certainly not in this country, yeah. But, you know, these people are there and they should be... Um, it's wrong, it grieves me and them that we're all folded into either Tories who were uh, driven out of the Labour Party by Jeremy Corbyn or kind of squidrismo-style fascists, the statue shaggers. There was lots of veterans at the riot in Whitehall last year. There is something else. There is a criticism of that. There were lots of veterans on the, on the BLM protests. Like it's possible to be a veteran and, and hate racism. It's mm. perfectly possible. But uh, when you talk about it now, like 70 years ago, to say you're a veteran and a socialist or a veteran and a communist or a veteran and anarchist wouldn't have been that surprising. But now, I think with the, given how our political culture is, it's almost impossible to... It's, ju- it's surprising when people say that, I think. For many, for the, for the public, if someone was saying I'm a veteran and a socialist, mm-hmm. it surprised them because the dominant idea, notion, the figure of the veteran is just connected to the right. I mean, there's, I mean I've seen pictures, actually, um, just just looking around for, for for images ahead of you know uh, November and so on ahead of this interview, and you see these incredible um, groups of people, and it's ex service personnel for the CND, yeah. and these are pictures from the seventies, the eighties, mm-hmm. and and it's guys who were in the Second World War who were saying we shouldn't have nuclear weapons, yeah. and agree or disagree with them, mm-hmm. that existed. Yeah. It was. Thousands of people believed in that. We know because we have the chapter names and people went on demonstrations. Yeah. And yet, like you say, from the contemporary conversation today, yeah. they it's, never existed. I and think, it feels to me almost like, well, we have to remember all those people who died and made yeah. sacrifices unless they happen to politically disagree with the status quo we exactly, have now. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, an even more recent example um, would be like someone like Paddy Astown. Like, you can talk about how good of a liberal Paddy Astown actually was, but he was a liberal. He expressed liberal values. He was ex-military and ex-MIC, he was in the SBS for God's sake, and he was elected for decades in Yeovil, a garrison town. Like, you can debate how left he is, but clearly, even more recently than the wake of the Second World War, there were people on the left, broadly speaking, who were veterans. 
Um, so the, it's, it's interesting how rapid this has changed and the dominant narrative has become, you, how, could, how is it possible? I can't even consider that you might be a veteran on the left. It's really strange. So this change in the sort of cultural zeitgeist, mm -hmm which I don't think anybody would disagree with. Something clearly has quite decisively changed. Yeah. Some people say it's for the better, some people for the worse, whatever, but it's clearly changed. One of the reasons you give as to why that's happened is something called troop fucking. Yeah, so that's um, an American, an ex-US Marine friend of mine, Marcus, um, who's uh, on Left Flank Veterans, a really good American podcast, came up with this term. Um, and it's basically, I suppose you could describe it less colourfully, it's like putting the troops on a pedestal. Elevating the troops as some kind of moral. This is the moral standard. The military are, are someone we should. Military people are people we should look up to, and that's part of um, something much broader. I think people know this transition has happened because you can see it with the way remembrance has changed and stuff like that, and the way we're expected to talk about troops. But it's actually part of something broader. The, the militarization offensive. There's a really good academic, Paul Dixon, who's done a report on this called Warrior Nation, um, and it's basically so mid 2000s. The wars are going very badly. Everyone disagrees with the wars virtually. This is like, that's the dominant idea about the wars and the military needs to address that. And so what they do is they, Gordon Brown fronts a report written by various people, which looks at how other countries um, deal with um, popularizing the military, keeping the military popular. And uh, they draw on the, the, the Americans, they look at the Canadians, they look at the French um, and various other allied nations. And they, they really like the American model. You can see in their, their writing, they really like the American model. Um, which came out of like post-Vietnam, um, deeply you know traumatic for the American psyche, and they try and borrow that and directly plop it onto Britain. So the thank you for your service shit, which British veterans find really jarring. It's really because our conception of ourselves is like stoic and first world war and over the top lands. And they take this American model, which is quite happy clappy, and just plonk it um, on Britain. And this is part of what's called the militarization offensive. And that's around the same time, 2008, the report came out, the recognition of the Armed Forces Insight report. And um, that's around the same time you see General Dannett who's in charge of the army at the time. Um, you see the rise of Help for Heroes. And you see the sun jump on this through our good friend Tom Newton Dunn, who's one of the leading figures in this. Um, and, uh, and, and they're trying to deter stimmy criticism of the wars by suggesting it's disrespectful to the troops. We need to repopularize the troops. We put the troops between the war and the criticism. Which and lots of people, not just on the left, lots of people were critical of the of the wars, whether in their conception or the conduct of the mm. wars. Um, and so this is part of a process. It's a top down process. The army are obviously involved um, to to try and um, keep in the box or put back in the box anti war criticism. And so that's where we see um, this the the rise in what Marcus calls, and I kind of like the term troop fucking. Um, but they, really that's where that comes from. So it's not, it hasn't just spontaneously developed. Britain has a really weird relationship with its military. And um, the John Bull position, the Brit English John Bull position is to be quite anti-militaristic, mm. not necessarily peace orientated, but the idea of a standing army historically mm. is quite controversial in this country. And partially that comes from Cromwell's repression and other periods of repression mm. when, the, when the army policed the country um, and Cromwell canceled Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we have a much more, I think in this country we actually like the Navy because helpfully it's normally very fucking far away. But the idea of having soldiers kicking around um, it is worrying. And that, that is, it's kind of out, of out of sync with the British attitude to its army. Like I can remember when I joined, we were not popular. 2004, we were not popular. Squatty pubs and civvy pubs. And I talked to guys who joined in the 80s and 90s. Soldiers were not popular. And so even more so for then the public where this shift's been quite subtle, I think for us, us who've served, uh, in the military, it's very stark that last week you hated us and now we're the best thing since sliced bread. But that's interesting because you get these kind of conspiracy theories perpetuated by right-wing media mm -hmm. and they say, oh my God, this is terrible. Somebody somebody cancelled a veteran. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is terrible. And you're saying actually, this is a 20, 20, 10 years yeah, yeah. ago, it was 15 years ago, yeah, it was yeah, actually... Yeah. Paul Dixon talks about this a lot. Um, it's, it's part, it's feeds into the stab in the back, the Dolstar stuff, but he talks about the moral panic, the moral outrage is one of the tactics which militarists use. And he details, he's a brilliant academic, he's a Birkbeck, um, and he talks about the moral outrage. And, and basically in the post-Vietnamic, it's really, it's very anglo brain because in the post vietnam experience, that moral outrage, and there is no evidence for this. Jerry Lemke has done a, a big study on this. No evidence for hippies spitting on veterans. There's none, it's rubbish. It was reported, some people claimed it, but it doesn't seem to have happened. Also veterans, military people coming back into the country, 
to military airports. The lounges at military airports are not generally filled with hippies, in my experience. So there's that question of access. And in fact, the veterans were on the streets protesting uh, in many cases. But the British version of that, and it's hilarious because they detail in the report um, examples. And one of them is that an officer was turned away from Harrods because mm. he was in uniform. And it's, amazing, it's funny to me that the English version of the hippie spits on veteran thing is Tarquin couldn't get his hamper for the officer's summer ball. It's very like Anglo, if you know what I mean. And they give other examples as well of soldiers having to change into civilian clothing before they came back through an airport or whatever. Uh, but it basically, it's, it's uh, that, you know, and you look at the, the sun and the mail, the people who are pumping out this stuff and the far right jump on it as well. So it's, it's kind of moral panic stuff and to reinforce the establishment to reinforce the ruling class. I mean, the thing that happens post-Vietnam with Nixon, I mean, like I say, this is from above, from yeah. the presidency, the Republican Party saying we have to we have to transform the sort of political zeitgeist around the armed forces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very similar to the war on drugs. Very similar. You have yeah. a whole transformation of, of, of basically yeah. the sort of popular conception of something driven by the politically and the media. Yeah, yeah. And like you say, we have our own version here. It's a bit... We do, yeah. yeah. It's a bit different. But what I would say is as well, Joe, is, you know, I remember being a kid mid to late 1990s, mm. so pre-Iraq, but you'd have, you know, you'd have remembrance services at school or whatever, you'd have the old boys come with their medals and so on, and, and people talk about classic British understatement. I don't mm. like stereotypes, mm -hmm. but it, it was true. It was very yeah. understated. Yeah. Something has really, really, really changed where people are walking around with, you know, never forget, lest we forget on their Adidas trainers yeah, 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 and yeah. Dr dressed up as giant poppies. And it's look, very strange. You, you do that. Look, I, it's, a, it's a free country. You do that. Yeah. yeah. But something has really shifted and that definitely is an understatement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, not, I'm no defender of like British culture, whatever that means, but it's quite un-British in a way. Mm. It sounds weird, but it's not. Remembrance and the, and the tone of remembrance from the off, mm. it's supposed to be like a funeral. Mm. Remembrance is a funeral. Exactly. It's not a festival of obedience, which is what it's become. It's supposed to be, um, you know, old boys sipping their pint, sad, remember your mates, you go and stand mm. and, and remember the fallen. Mm. And I'm down for that. Like when we're back to that, mm. I will go down the cenotaph with my medals and my beret on. Mm. Like I, I, I'm happy to do that. But it's become something very different, as you say, very different and um, deeply reactionary and weird. And it's not in keeping with the often problematic military traditions that are connected to mm. remembrance in the cenotaph and so on. And it does feel very new. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I, I don't think I'm old. You know, yeah. it does, th th we're not talking about 50, 60 years ago. This is like you said, it's post 9-11 really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. post uh, early 21st century. Final question. Mm -hmm. You talked about blazers, and you talked about the, the mainstream sort of veteran community. Um, maybe you can also sort of illuminate what that concept means, the blazer, blazerism. Yeah. And then you've got the kind of anti-blazer, mm -hmm. the white knight, quite literally, Prince Harry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's his vibe? Do you think he's for real or...? or I think is he is he Britain's most radical veteran today? Well, he did, he said some cool stuff around um, around uh, BLM and stuff. You know, his wife's a woman of color. I think Ash had it right when he, she talks about his transition is from the the kind of old world ruling class to the kind of liberal aristocracy. I'm paraphrasing, but I remember mm -hmm. she wrote mm -hmm. a piece, and I think that's right. So he, that's part of a move. I, I I know people who served with Harry, and they say he was a decent guy. He was a decent officer, as officers go, as officers in the poshest regiments of all, the household cavalry and the guards go. He was a decent and capable officer. Um, uh, maybe, maybe it's genuine, maybe it's um, performative. Um, I suspect he probably is angry about the way his wife is treated by the royal family, understandably. Um, I hope he returns to the agitator tradition. I hope he becomes a, a Colonel Rainsborough and becomes an anti-monarchist. I don't think it's gonna happen. Um, but no, he's an interesting character because I think in the way that the, the certain organisations are put there to lead veterans, as Haig said when the RBL was founded, he wanted the men back under their officers. Mm -hmm. um, certain individuals are positioned or find their own way into like leadership roles of the armed forces community. Johnny Mercer, my old mate, Tom Tugendhat, people like this. And Harry is an example of that as well, I think. And he was a, he was a central figure in the Invictus Games, which is a kind of Olympics for disabled veterans, for wounded veterans. I don't think he does Partly funded fit. by... Yeah, big arms by, by big arms, of course. Um, um, I, he doesn't quite fit into the kind of Mercer category. Maybe he's genuine in some ways. I don't know. I don't know. I think better of him than those guys, I think, um, as a pretty rabid Republican myself. But I don't know how much of it is performative. Blazers and blazerism. What is this? What is this concept? So um, when I was around Veterans for Peace, and Veterans for Peace never really approved of the term, we, um, we um, were kind of the radical edge of the military community. And um, we would encounter on our trips to the Cenotaph every year to, 
do a white poppy wreath, lay a white poppy wreath, are the veterans. And we would chat to them. We had a shared military background. But uh, uh, Blazerism basically came, they're kind of sartorial things. They're, um, they're blazers literally with the medals and the berets. And some of those guys were, were fine. I know people who do that whole thing, that's fine. But um, we were looking for a term to explain that tendency. It's, and it's probably the dominant tendency within, within the ex-military community. And we were searching around, we were looking for a, 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 something like Uncle Tom, which obviously is a name for a, a black guy who sides with the oppressor against his people. And we very quickly realised it was a bad idea for a bunch of white dudes to like rip off the language of, of black radicalism. Um, so we chose Blazer, but it has a similar thing. It's like a pro-establishment veteran, a pro-war veteran, because that, that, that's the biggest um, kind of cohort within that. You know, mm. the guys who go down there, they're, they're kind of, they like the fact they're in the military and they like the state and so on, generally speaking. Um, and so it was gradually became a thing. And the guy who came up with it was actually a boomer veteran who's decorated for valor in Northern Ireland. He was actually, because it also means kind of a boomer veteran, um, um, though it's, it's been extended since, I think. Uh, but it's that it's the basically a right wing veteran. What we arrived at was we were trying to formulate an idea of what a right wing veteran was, uh, and we basically worked off the blazers. And it's a weird thing because I think it's actually quite a cool look, and I have worn it myself. I've seen. I was going to say, yeah, Joe, yeah. I've seen you wearing yeah, a blazer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah I'm, I'm kind of down with that, and it's also ripe for subversion. So I kind of like it in that way as well. Uh, but that's really, really what it means. And it's not. It's not about fashion choices. It's about the politics that go with it. And the critique was, it's. Not wearing the beret and blazer is where, when the beret and the blazer and the medals wear you, but you're subsumed within this military identity, this reactionary mil military identity. And, and the way you phrase the, the politics of, of it is really interesting. So you say it's not necessarily an ideology, but more yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a personality sort of trait or a set of personality traits. Yeah. I, I, was, I was cautious about using conservative anarchism, because um, I'm quite attached to anarchism, obviously, as we all are. <clears throat> <laughs> but... Um, but um, uh, I think that's kind of what it is. And it's a weird, it's kind of like your, your old man who would feel oppressed, rail against the state if they wouldn't let him use his hosepipe in summer, but will be on the Facebook group, the local Facebook group, being like, shoot the fucking BLM protesters. It's that kind of thing where they, they're kind of anti-authoritarian. There's a libertarian streak, but mm. they're also kind of down with authority if it's, you know, thrown against the right people they don't like. Yeah. And that's a real trend. And it comes from training as well. There's a, there's a, there's a kind of, in the military, you self-police so if anyone goes off at a tangent, you're like, you knock them back in the mm. back. And it, it's a kind of expression of that um, post-service. Um, yeah, so it's a, yeah, it's a kind of, re uh, but, and it's also to say that no, it's not that there, there is a collectivist element, but it's limited. It's like reactionary, nasty right-wing collectivism. They will do stuff. If you go to a military charity, it'll be full of blazers and they're really committed. They're genuine and understandably so to like helping their fellow veterans. Um, but outside that, there is no solidarity. Within it, there is enormous solidarity based on the lived experience of being inside this, this engine of violence for so long. So it's a, they're a really interesting. And there are other currents within it as well. Not everyone fits in that category. But I think that's the broadest kind of group. Johnny Mercer, is he a blazer? Definitely. He's like King Blazer. King, King blazer. of the Blazers. King of the Blazers. Or one of them. One of them. And he's very popular with that. His stock went down when he was actually in office in his little veterans department, which he sold his soul to get. But now he's out, he can ride around with the rolling, rolling thunder veteran Hells Angels and his stock is kind of back up with that cohort. But he's an interesting character because he's purely an expression of that, of that, that kind of military thing and the kind of bumbling junior officer. Um, uh, and he's another guy who cause, he's like Ann Middleton was trying to use the military lens to understand all kinds of stuff. But Mercer is trying to do it. I'm sure he thinks in good faith that he's you know, an honourable man and all this and he's trying to do right by them. I mm. do believe that. I don't think he's a particularly complex or intellectual man to know that what, what he's actually involved in. Um, but he's a good example of this kind of, the kind of patrician love of our blokes um, kind of guy he would meet. There's like, a, I met so many of them in the military. That's a kind of archetype, the rugger boy blusterer. Mm. Um, and I met guys who served with him and it's you know, mixed response. Some people think he's an absolute jobs worth. Some people served with him and say he's a great guy and he was a good, he was a good officer. I don't really try and make a judgment. Um, though he blocked me, so that's a little bit of antagonism uh, for asking a mild question on Syria. Um, but yeah, he's a, he's a good example. And he certainly positioned himself as the veterans champion, as Harry has in a different way. And as, again, it's individuals and organisations. Some organisations do this, um, get the men back under their officers, that's where they should be, the chaps. Uh, and then there's individuals who do it. And Johnny Mercer is one of a constellation of ex-military people, normally ex-officers, who are in that patrician way that officers love their men are trying to do right by the blokes. But make sure they never get ideas above their station. Exactly. 
Exactly. You can campaign within these narrow parameters, and that's fine. And actually, what we want is um, is uh, something quite different from that.